were were you were you motivated by uh, a political reason to do this, or was it just something you stumbled into? How can you explain the genesis of this? Um, the genesis. Well, it, it depends how far you want to go back. I mean. <laughs> Start. I mean, the whole point of the lottery of birth, I mean, we're all shaped by our influences and forces that we don't control. I, I think I was lucky enough to have parents who encouraged me to question, um, and I really took that, and I think I ran with it, and I wanted to get outside, you know, leave the edu formal education system as soon as I could to start my education. Um, <laughs> and when I did, at 17, I, I mean, I fell in love with philosophy, history, economics, politics. I mean, suddenly everything came alive for me. And when you learn about the world, you learn how you know, how unjust it is, and how in many ways it's really, really terrible. And the kind of simple morals you learn as a kid, you realize, no, adults don't practice them. Our governments don't practice them. Um, so what to do in that situation? Well, I think there are two options. One is to turn away, because it's very, power it's very um, disempowering. Um, it's very depressing. So if you don't find an outlet, if you don't find something constructive you can do, I think you ultimately you turn away from it, and you begin to find a way to slot into the system as it is. So writing the book and ultimately writing the film, I mean, it was a way of trying to learn more about it, engage with these ideas, um, but also do something constructive. I think that's the challenge for all of us. The system doesn't make it easy um, to take a different path. It's a, it's a creative act. Yeah. Good. Who's got a question? Yes. Me. Yeah, me. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, well, in, in the film, in the commentary, in terms of your um, solution to the, you know, the, the Maya that is modern civilization, as it were, you, there were three words used in, a, a, in this sort of optimistic passage, which were um, democracy, equality, and sustainability. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. It's just, just thinking about those three concepts, though, do you not think that there is, I don't, I don't want to bring a note of pessimism, pessimism into the film, but do you not think there's a real tension between the first two and sustainability? If you take democracy, for example, we're all voting every four years, and when you get near an election, the votes tend to be about whether taxes are going to be 40% or 42%, and then you vote in the parties, you're only going to have to pay 40% tax. Um, right. So, and, and for um, equality, Obviously, everyone wants to share of resources. So those two things together, do you not think makes sustainability in terms of the environment, etc., much more difficult to uh, uh, maintain? No, I mean, on the contrary, I think the exact opposite. I mean, it's a, it's a complex question, you know, you could talk about it like you write a book on it, um, which I currently am. <laughs> but, I mean, I think you're assuming that we live in a democracy. I don't, you know, if you study kind of political philosophy, you know, you, you know, lecturers will say, actually, you don't live in a democracy, you live in perhaps a polyarchy, as Robert Dahl would say. Um, and that's basically a system where you have a small elite who control everything, but they allow you to pick your leaders every four years. I don't think we live in a democracy. I think we have, um, or, you know, if I was to be generous, we have a very, very limited, constrained form of democracy. And we have a mainstream media and an education system which shapes us in ways um, that conform to systems of power. So a genuine democracy would be far more equal. I mean, those two go together. You need equality of genuine democracy. How would, it, how would it look, this genuine democracy? Oh my, I mean, there are... Well, first of all, I think, economically, you'd have to introduce democracy into our economy. I mean, if you have formal democracy politically, but not economically, I mean, it's just... It's lame. I mean, there's nothing... Um, it, it lacks teeth. Um, I don't see why we'd limit it to one area, not the other. And the various models have been devised. I mean, if you look at, for example, one of the economists in the film, Michael Albert, um, he, with another Harvard economist named Robert Hanel, have devised an alternative, an alternative economy called Paracon, which is participatory economics, um, where they have worked out very formally, and you can look at, you know, if you're into mathematics or economics, you can look at their Princeton published um, book on this, where you know they go through the formulas, they show it works um, easily as efficient, I think far more efficient than our capitalist market system. Um, and it's neither a communist economy or, or a, simply a market system. Um, so I mean, the, the solutions are there, they really are there. 
if you want to look for them, I mean, if anyone wants to, you know, please email me. I can send you books on it. I can send you, you know, specific details, what, where to look, what to read. Get the solution into a mass movement. And, and absolutely. That's the problem, isn't it? It's like, yeah, absolutely. So where do you start? I mean, it's a bit perplexing, right? It seems to me media is a huge part of it. I mean, that's what excites me about film, writing. Well, anywhere we can, we have to encourage people to question. We have to encourage people, well, basically show people there are other ideas out there. But of course, the, the media, I mean, the second film in this series is going to focus on the history of PR and on the mainstream media. Now, I, if anyone's interested in really solution... Uh, can, can I just ask you about that next okay. project? Because that would be a question I've been... What, so this is your next project. You've got another project. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, so project. it's the same project. It's all creating freedom. Um, it started out, it's going to be one film. But, you know, it's so exciting and carried away, it's become at least three. Oh, right. We're working on the second film. Okay. We've shot pretty much all the interviews. Wow. Done a good portion of the B-roll, and hopefully, you know, in a few months, we'll, you know, we'll begin editing. Um, Josh is working on his own project, which links in on, on the alternative media. Josh has been part of the Occupy Media Group in Occupy Wall Street, um, doing great work there. Um, <laughs> I think I should stop. maybe pass over to Josh. I've been talking a long time. Sorry. Yeah, it's it's. I think you know. The, the, I think the, the series is only gonna get stronger as 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 um, each film follows. Um, but we've got some extraordinary interviews for this next piece, and it's, it's coming together well. But I've been off shooting this other film, um, which is a. It's a verite piece, it's a completely different kind of movie, but it's intimately connected with the, um, the ideas in, in, or the ideas that are kind of be more going to be explored in the second film. Um, but just to speak to more about what you were saying, my experience in the last year has been a really interesting one, kind of involved in these fledgling social movements that obviously have been informed by past movements as well, but they're operating in a very horizontal way. Um, they're practicing what is commonly called direct democracy, participatory democracy, and that comes obviously with its whole, its own set of problems and issues. Um, but it's very, very interesting to see, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in countries across the globe now starting to come together at a grassroots level outside of the, you know, electoral system, uh, renouncing that brand of politics because it's become patently clear. Um, especially to a kind of a new generation of human beings that it's not um, by the people and for the people, these governments. Um, and I've been working specifically in independent media, you know, movement media, generating a lot of short form stuff, um, especially in the first few months of Occupy Wall Street. So we're using a lot of these tools that have been developed by these big corporations um, and in a sense, it's a sort of battle for control of the narrative. It'll be interesting to know when the Arab Spring finally hits Britain. Right, <laughs> right. well, it may be sooner than you think. <laughs> right, who's got another question? Yes, in the back, yes. Yes, you. Um, I understand the concept of questioning, and it's a great concept, great idea. And I like the fact that you say we're conditioned by our parents, we're conditioned by our religion, our countries, it makes great sense. But then to actually question your parents, question your religion, everything you've been taught, I think you mentioned is a struggle and you mentioned it's painful, a painful process. And then that the creativity needs options, which is great, but then you're going up against laws, powers, politicians, and people like Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, you're faced with potentially death, death <laughs> threats, and because you, you're going up against the powerful. So I suppose my question is, is the emotion underlining it all, is why the masses don't do it, is fear. Like why, we know that there's injustice, we know that there's poverty, but the reality is that individually, to quit your job is scary. To tell your parents that I can't do this, or something along those lines, to stand up against the resistance or a government or a corporation is very scary. And as an individual, I wouldn't like to do that. Just, it's a natural reaction in me not to do that, because it's scary. So, as individuals who have found an outlet, 
how do you handle fear? <laughs> fear. Um, well, in this country, um, we don't face death for dissent, luckily, yet. Um, but the only reason we don't is because of people in the past who fought for those rights. They're constantly under attack, of course. Um, I mean, seriously, so, since 9-11. Um, but I think, I think what we have to, I mean, just living in this country, therefore, we have privilege. You know, we are very privileged to be here. A lot of the wealth we have is on the back of colonialism, imperialism. We have privilege and, I think, a moral obligation with that. And there's a weird paradox, because the people who would most benefit from a, from a fairer system are, are the ones least able to affect change often, because they are simply struggling to get food on the table. Um, and so what, what I would say, of course, it's not easy. And, and at some point, hopefully, you could inspire enough people, you know, who are really at the bottom of society to stand up together, because collectively they can affect change. But until then, I'd like to say, the more privilege you have, the more duty you have to actually try and do something, to really understand that your privilege is not deserved. Nothing we have is deserved. It's all luck. Us is, you know, what we have in life is luck. Even the capacity to work hard, you know, it's lucky we have those genes. If we're smart, it's lucky we've had an education that has given us um, discipline or whatever. Um, so, I mean, I, that's one part of an answer, it's just, you know, if you feel a bit of fear, I'd say, well, you know, there's obligation that comes with privilege, so if you have privilege, do something about it, do something with it. Um, but, but, but the other thing is, of course it's not easy, but of course, easy hard, it, it depends on how you look at things in life. I mean, I can't, in my life, I like to live my life thinking, well, if I'm going to, imagine I've got a year to live, what would I like to do? Instantly takes away all my fear. I just go ahead and I do what I want to do. And the reality is, life does go quickly. This might be all we have. What do you want to use it for? Do you want it to be in itself a work of art, trying to do something beautiful and effect change, or simply conform and play it safe? Whenever, whenever you really widen the context, I think fear dissipates. But that's not to say that it's equally easy for everyone. I think I'm very lucky and it's easy, you know, I've had opportunities which many people don't. So we each just got to find a way to do what we can. It's a creative act, but nothing will value you get to without. Yeah, taking risks and working hard. Um, I, yeah, I just wanted to speak to that a little bit. Um, I just got back from Madrid this morning. I was there for three. Some of you may have heard a little bit about what's been going on there. There's been huge protests there. Tuesday was a big day, and I was in Plata de Neptuno with along with about 160,000 people. Um, and uh, kind of mainstream narrative is that you know protesters started attacking police and. And so they, you know, had to defend themselves. What happened? Because I was there and saw it all. Um, was that an overwhelmingly peaceful crowd was, you know, charged repeatedly with by over a thousand riot cops who were, you know, obviously surrounded by a much larger crowd, but they were beating indiscriminately the young, the old, women, children, firing um, a mass of rubber bullets rounds into the crowds for, you know, for several hours. Um, so, uh, what was extraordinary to me was to come to this country. It was the first time I was in Spain as well. So interesting, my like, uh, first day in Spain. But what was incredible to see was all of these people, a real cross section as well, coming to together and, in a sense, beginning to lose their fear. Obviously, we saw that, you know, and we've seen that throughout the Arab Spring and stuff. But it's extraordinary to start to get a whiff of that in mainland Europe, in a, in a city like Madrid. Um, where people are really facing such harsh um, realities and uh, you know we're looking at something like 25% official unemployment, 40% among the other 30s, uh, people losing their houses every day. Um, you know you can, it's palpable there, a sense of desperation, obviously it's only going to get worse. Um, so there is like just when you're confronted with that physical violence on the part of the state when there's that kind of pushback which I've seen in a lot of places over the last year in New York, where, I, where I'm based, it's been overwhelmingly violent. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's obviously, it smacks of desperation on the part of the state. That's the sort of last thing that they resort to. And when you see people standing strong in their tens of thousands and coming back after they've been charged um, by, by, by police beating them, that's, I mean, that, for me, it empowers me and it makes me you know, proud obviously to be among these people and it gives me a sense of hope because I think that's, you know, that's very hopeful. That's very eloquent.
Uh, we have time for two more questions. It's a very spirited uh, discussion. Yes, you in the front. Yeah. Hi, I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank you both for making this movie because I think the movie itself is the answer to the question, which is what can we do? And I think that we all, when we, you know, we thought these thoughts, but you have that incredible feeling of apathy or what can one person do? And I think by one plus one, um, making a film like this shows us all that there's something that we all can do. And I just really want to thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> One last person, please. Yes, in the front, yes, with your hand up, yes. A completely different kind of question, because I'm not going to talk about the politics. Very, very interesting that, that, that it is. Um, I'm interested in your artistic influences um, as, a film, as filmmakers, so uh, in terms of how you shot it and, and what your influence is there. Um, I guess Josh might have more to say about this, but I mean, for me, I don't know. It wasn't a film. I, 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 you know, the film's good. You know, I've never been. It's, it doesn't blow me. Or you know, I, I think film books are good. Poetry's good. You know, I wouldn't say I was a film lover before I made the film. What excited me was the ideas, and but I realised, you know, to hold someone's attention for an hour and a half, um, and because my background had been in painting and, and visual arts anyway, I wanted to make a beautiful film. I wanted it to look beautiful. I wanted the, the pacing and the music to be beautiful. Um, and medium in that sense is a message. Um, but I'm not aware of any, or actually, to be honest, actually I should name one film, which is a documentary called The Corporation, um, which is really fantastic. If you haven't seen it, it's online for free. Um, it has a few of the same interviewees. And I saw that years ago in the cinema, and I thought, huh, that's quite powerful. You know, I, I wouldn't mind doing something like that. And I nicked the idea of you know the interviewees looking into the camera and having a black background. Um, so I guess I just select that one film. Um, and I will pass over to Josh. Uh, well, my background is in narrative um, film making. I worked as doing lighting and camera for years, um, just starting off here when I was a teenager, then went to New York and started working in the States. Um, so, and, uh, so I'm completely obsessive about light and 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 um, the movement of the camera and the position, the composition, all this stuff. So, I, you know, to the point where I probably annoyed Raoul. Um But um, I think that, you know, some of my kind of biggest influences visually are, you know, I don't know, Tarkovsky and um, uh, Terence Malick and these kinds of people who inform, like, my shooting style. Um, but what I, 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 what I loved about this picture was the opportunity to, because we were, you know, we had an idea of what the ideas, what the sort of central themes were in the film, we could then sort of take that time, as opposed to the verite piece, take that time, go in and just kind of design these these landscapes where you're kind of almost projecting these ideas onto. And so, you know, what I love is the, the, the night stuff. Um, and so I'm very conscious of the light. I'm shooting either like earlier in the morning um, or in the magic hour. Um, and then, um, you know, there's, there's, there's so many films I couldn't begin to name them that um, I'm sure I've been inspired by. But uh, going into this, going to city, into cities uh, like New York at night, into Midtown Manhattan, um, with a couple of long lenses, um, and just shooting, you know, through the night is, is something that is, is an amazing experience. And and luckily now we have these incredible cameras that we can kind of somehow afford. And um, this is a Blu-ray DVD that's projected this, so it's still blowing my mind that, you know, it looks so great. What's a 4K projector here? It's, it's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to, I was also just wanted to... I was not wrong, but it is really, it looks amazing. I mean, yeah. you think that 20 years ago to get that, you would have had to spend a million dollars. Yeah, it's, it's, again, it's like on the media side, it's the democratization yeah. of um, filmmaking, of media production. On the production side, we still have obviously issues on the distribution side, on the reproduction. Um, so there has to be, you know, a movement um, to to really kind of jumpstart our own channels, our own networks now, to try to bypass these gatekeepers that still remain and these bottlenecks that are building up, um, which you know all about. Yeah. Um, but I also just wanted to, before we go, I just wanted to thank all um, the friends also that have come and my family, particularly my mother who's here. Kathy, who's been an unbelievable support um, throughout um, this project. So. I think a round of applause Thank for you. Kathy. Yes. Yes. Uh,
Um, yeah, I know I already said it, but my family are here. If you could give them a round of applause. <laughs> We've got 31 documentaries on Saturday night. Jeremy Irons is here with his environmental uh, doc, which is also very good. It's also nominated. Competition is fierce. And Joff and Rob, we at Raindance anyway, will be plotting your careers, the life of this movie and the trilogy with great interest. Congratulations. It blew me away. I saw it for the first time here tonight. Congratulations. Let's go talk in the bar. Thank you very much.